not known for their clapping at all, I'd have to say that I think Hooker, if he faced the question of clapping, probably would have said, it's fine for Anglicans, probably adding, if you really want to do that sort of thing. <laughs> but here's what Rasenga says on page two of your uh, handouts about Christianity, Christmas and culture. Shunned by the Puritan authorities of early New England because of its connections to pagan seasonal celebrations and to sexual and alcohol excesses, the colonial Christmas was celebrated mainly by the working class and as occasion for public revelry and carnival. The 18th century often became riotous. The transformation of Christmas into a domestic holiday coincided with the growth of consumer culture in the 19th century America. And so it's continued. We're about to move into one of the great consumer fests of the year, aren't we? Uh, Americans think that Christmas basically begins with Thanksgiving and ends with Super Bowl Sunday is sometime in the new year. It's a whole month of buying and eating. Uh, in fact, just a bit more than that. But of course, Christians in their dialogue over this, over Christmas and uh, the like, have struggled hugely with this. Hugely with this. Because they have felt that consumerism, of course, has the capacity to pull religion out of itself and to make religion the subject or the servant or indeed the slave of faith. So it becomes tamed and domesticated and commodified and ultimately trivialised in the service of consumerism. And that seems to me to be one of the dangers that Christians face in relation to Christmas. And I wonder, and this is just an open question, what are the comparable dangers for Islam in the celebrations around that? Are there comparable issues around Eid, for instance? Or would it be something else? It's just an open question. If you look on the uh, penultimate quote there, David Doherty, who's uh, I think a, a very, very interesting writer, uh, a rare writer in uh, religion, has this to say. Looking at the relationship between religion and consumerism, he says, there's a connection. And it lies, he says, not in the opposition between the symbols of natural and transcendent faiths, but in the analysis of the way the former appropriates the latter, only to discover that it swallowed something alien, something that at some stage will burst out and consume the social order that initially consumed it. Now, do you see what that quote's saying? It's saying, a little bit like, I suppose, the film Alien, the thing you thought that you'd eaten might eat you. But actually, this is a repetitive cycle. And some of the things that come to consume Christianity themselves find that they are consumed within Christianity's ongoing life. In other words, culture bursts out of faith, but faith continues to burst out of culture. Let me give you uh, one very concrete example of this from contemporary culture. Uh, and I'm choosing a rather uh, saccharine, I would say, uh, slightly schmaltzy image here to uh, just to illustrate this. Just as a show of hands, um, how many of you have seen or are aware of the musical The Wizard of Oz? Is anybody not? <coughs> Fine, that's right, most of you are. And The Wizard of Oz, um, as you know, uh, was a famous film um, and came up just before the Second World War, one of those early films in uh, colour. And of course it has a young Judy Garland in, singing. Uh, and if you know the story at all, it's about, uh, it starts off with a tornado in which uh, a young girl is transported through the tornado into a new strange land called Oz, where she encounters uh, a lion without courage, uh, a straw man um, who's basically seeking metal, uh, a tin man, and her dog Toto. And they go on the yellow brick road to find the Wizard of Oz because the Wizard of Oz alone can get Dorothy home. Most people, when they look at the film, think, well, what a lovely tale about homecoming. 
What most people don't know about the film, though, is that it's actually based on a satirical work by a man called Frank Baum. And Baum wrote his satirical novel in the uh, very early 20th century as a critique of the California gold rush. Hence, The Yellow Brick Road is about gold, and Oz, as you probably realise now, is just ants. That's all it is. Oz equals ants. And so who are these characters in Frank Baum's novel? Well, Dorothy is the gullible country girl who gets swept up in the pursuit of riches. The tin man is the industrialist without the heart. The line looking for courage is another cipher for people who need courage but haven't got it. And the person of straw, of course, is again the peasant who really needs a brain but hasn't got one. Now, what Baum was saying in this novel is consumerism is responsible for sweeping all of these people up into the desire for undreamed riches. <clears throat> but their dream turns to ashes because when they get to the end of the Yellow Brick Road, what do they find? Nothing. Nothing. And of course in the film what you find is that the Wizard of Oz, the person who could produce this extraordinary homecoming, is just a fraud. Of course Dorothy gets home, she does, but of course that's one of the interesting things about the film, that right towards the end all she's wishing for is home. She wants to get back to the place where she belongs. In a similar vein, uh, Elton John, the uh, singer, songwriter, had an album in the 1970s called, anyone remember? Good Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, yeah. Which, of course, is that road. It's the Yellow Brick Road. And in the lyric of that song, talks about uh, his, uh, the, the subject of the song says, um, uh, I should have listened to my old man. Should have stayed on my father's farm and listened to my old man. What Elton John has done is reach back into Frank Baum's novel and realise that what you have here is a story about the prodigal son. You have a story about somebody who's got all of his riches, this easy credit, and has gone away and has blown it all on a huge consumer fest. That's essentially what the prodigal son is about. The yellow brick road led nowhere. And as Elton John, and as Frank Baum, and as the uh, Wizard of Oz celebrate, this is not the path to take. But, in all three cases, the song, the film, and the book say that there is a possibility of homecoming. But it would have been better never to have left in the first place. I'll just put it to you, that therefore, that one of the things that even Jesus is attentive to in the New Testament are the dangers of unbridled consumerism. That is at least one of the sub-themes of that story of the prodigal son. It's also there, relevant in other aspects of New Testament tradition, and I dare say in the Quran and in other faith traditions as well. Namely, the cleansing of the heart, the cleansing of the eyes, an understanding that all that glitters is not gold, and therefore actually concentrating on sifting and discerning consumerism is an urgent call to faith these days. And as much as we may accept that consumerism and faith uh, are alloyed and uh, compounded within the traditions, there's also a higher call within those traditions to think seriously and richly about a deeper discernment that separates these things out. Um, some years ago, there was a, a, a marvellous uh, piece of work done on uh, what was called uh, the Laodicean Hymnal. Now, this was a, a, a pretend Anglican hymnal for uh, Anglicans that couldn't cope with excessive or strong religion. So it was lots of lovely rewrites of hymns, uh, which would really suit Anglican congregations. 
some of my favourites included um, Not My Life, Let Me Be. Um, what other ones? Um, the Spirit of God Lands Somewhere Near Me. Um, that sort of thing, you get the idea. But if you get hymns, for example, O oh Jesus, I have promised to serve thee to the end, be thou forever near me, my master and my friend. I shall not fear the battle if thou art by my side, nor wander from the pathway if thou wilt be my guide. In modern language, this comes out as, O oh Jesus, I have tentatively committed to serve thee for an agreed period of time, subject to review. Be thou forever near me, but not too close, because I need my personal space. Be my colleague and my friend. I do actually fear the battle on grounds of health and safety, <laughs> and I will only wander from the pathway occasionally for some shopping and a coffee, for which you can still be my guide. You get the point. Mm -hmm. There's that sense in which faith in the 21st century, whether Christianity, Islam, Judaism, is something that people increasingly want on their own terms. And I just put it to you that one of the obligations of faith leaders these days is to meet people at that point and to say, yes, God indeed has entered into the world in text, in spirit, in inspiration, but there's also another calling, which is not to live by the standards of the world, but to live by different standards. And those things call into question some of the things we take for granted these days as individuals, as communicators, and indeed as consumers. A call, in other words, to be discerners of the world and not just lovers of the world. And so I just end with this final quote. Maybe one way to express the task or a task of theology is that of structuring mystery. One might go a little farther and call it even imposing structural mystery. But this involves crossing a boundary into an arena where humans have little power and what we have merely tends to encourage hubris. I want to suggest to you therefore that one of the things theology can help us with, whether that's Christian or Muslim theology, is on that journey it's thinking hard about the impact of consumerism on faith and recognising whilst it can't be stopped, at the same time it needs to be handled with care and discernment and hopefully with good humour too. Thank you very much.